it's time for our panel discussion. Uh, Mar Martin Wilder, who you met uh, earlier, uh, is the partner at Baker and McKenzie. Giles Parkinson, currently the editor of RenewedEconomy.com, uh, is a journalist of 30 years experience, uh, a former business editor and deputy editor of the Financial Review. And John O'Brien is a member of the Premier's Climate Change Council. Would you please give my guests a big round of applause? Now, <clears throat> something that you alluded to, uh, Martin, in your uh, in, uh, introductory speech was that uh, the very first sentence of this particular uh, report, that the politics of climate change are highly contested in Australia at this point in time. My question, coming from a science background, is why? The uh, science is in. Uh, very easy. Uh, political ideology. It's just, it is just that simple. So when I travel around the world and often get asked by people <coughs> what's going on in Australia, the only way I can describe it is imagine if the Tea Party had been elected um, in Australia with a very firm view on they don't believe in the science of climate change and there's a philosophical and, and an ideological view on climate change and how it should be managed and it's become a successful political um, tool in, in terms of arguing about our carbon tax and, and, and costs to households, which has been very successful politically and has got a government elected, arguably. But I don't recall the uh, federal government coming out and saying in recent years that climate change is crap. That was 2009 that that was said and that now they've moved on to accept climate change. That's what they're saying. Yep. Well, I, I guess they're saying is that we accept that there's a need to take action on climate change. Um, you know, whether or not the Prime Minister has a view that he accepts the science is not really for me to say. But the truth of the matter is that there is not a policy basis here that's based on, on the science and based on the key scientific evidence and then moving to basically um, follow what that science says. And I think that, that, that is one of the real challenges that we face here. And I think I'll make one other point, which is that in 1999, the then Howard government put out a blueprint for emissions trading in Australia. It was four guidebooks on how to design an ETS. That's the same guidebook that we had in, with John Howard's scheme, the same guidebook we had with the CPRS, the same guidebook and principles we've got with the current emissions trading scheme, and it will be the same guidebook that underpins, I suspect, what Palmer puts in. So in many ways, you know, we're not arguing about how to design a scheme, we're just arguing about the politics of, of really climate change here. John, within the state, um, is, would that statement read true for South Australia, that the politics of climate change are highly contested? Um, I, I think that's probably, probably similar, yes, uh, between the, the two major parties. Um, the, uh, one of the things that the, the Labor government here, and then I think the, the sole remaining Labor government has done, has been quite a strong supporter, and, and South Australia has actually benefited significantly from, from some of those measures. So we've got a very high penetration of renewable energy, um, there's sort of opportunities for, for business growth and advanced manufacturing coming out of that. Um, so the politics of it hasn't got quite so in the way here yet. Um, if the, the state election had gone the other way, we, maybe we would have seen, uh, seen some other A different outcome. outcomes. But, um, um, uh, well, Giles, uh, many of the implications of climate change can be ameliorated through effective policy responses, whereas poor public policy will exacerbate the challenges again. First page of this report. Would you agree with that? Can we actually do something about the problems that we're facing? Oh, of course we can. Look. And it's and it simply provides um, investment certainty for the people that will provide the technologies and um, the businesses that will do that. And I guess much of the conversation um, and the political debate has been characterised over the last five or ten years, particularly those who oppose it, is by saying, well, it's all too hard. It's impossible to do. It's too costly. Um, it'll destroy economies, businesses, home finance and what have you. And we're certainly seeing, at least in one part of that equation, say energy, and um, Martin mentioned solar before, that's actually a big game changer in what's happening now. And it's actually providing, people are taking up solar now, not because they want to save the planet, but because it's actually, there's an economic driver for it. It's cheaper than sourcing, sourcing electricity from the grid. And this is true in Australia, it's true in China, it's true in Europe, it's true in America. And this is having a massive, this is causing a massive transformation of a multi-trillion dollar industry. 
and people shouldn't underestimate the impact that that will have. Um, it'll be as dramatic as we've seen with newspapers and the internet and telcos with mobiles. And so that's one part of the equation, but there's other parts which will be energy efficiency and there's other parts in redesigning businesses um, which are all at hand and all they actually need is this certainty, um, this investment certainty. So you price the problem and then you act on it and off you go and it could probably happen for a lot, cost a lot less than we think it might. And that neatly leads us into uh, a point that you made uh, early, Martin, about the, the fact that the rest of the world is doing something. It is heading in the direction of, uh, of, of reacting to the influences and the possible consequences of climate change. And that there are consequences for Australian business of the international policies as they're unfolding. Let's just go through those one by one. Changes in demand for our traditional customers of Australian fossil fuels and commodities. Now, let's take the fossil fuels for a start. Um, despite all of the, you know, we've got to use less coal, yada, 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 we're still selling billions of tonnes, a gazillion, or perhaps with the World Cup, a Brazilian, tonnes of coal to China uh, on, a, uh, on a daily basis. So are we actually seeing any real change in, in the sale of our fossil fuels? I think we are. When you look at what's happened with thermal coal, there's, there's certainly a shift. But it's, it's a very simple equation. When a country says, I'm no longer going to buy as much coal as we have in the past, as China have done, they've clearly articulated that they're going to change their energy mix and their demand for coal is going to basically decrease and they're going to transition their economy. That sends a signal that your main market is changing its demand basis. So if you're supplying to a market, you've got to think, OK, well, what are my alternatives? Where do I go? Who are my other competitors? There's other coal being produced cheaply on the east coast of Africa, which can easily get to China much at a much less um, cost than we can do in Australia. So it's really, this is not about necessarily about um, an attack on fossil fuels. It's really saying, when we look at the global commodity markets and the demand, and you look, when a country in America says, we're going to put strict controls on old coal power stations and phase them out, well, they're obviously the product that supplies those is not going to be in, in as great a demand as it has in the past. So it's just simple demand supply economics. What about uh, other commodities? John, what other commodities are going to be affected by the international trend towards dealing with climate change? Well, I think, I mean, I'm, I've, I come to this from a very different angle. So Premier's Climate Change Council is one of my hats, but I also um, sort of run a business called Australian Clean Tech. We work with Australian technology companies who are providing the solutions to the world. Mm -hmm. So other commodities are actually sort of the, the, the new technologies. So we, we've done some work with a company in Melbourne called Raygen who are now selling advanced manufacturing, concentrating solar panels to China and solutions to China. So instead of exporting coal, we'll start actually exporting, potentially, if we put some, uh, the frameworks in place, we'll actually start exporting the new technologies um, to, to other places in the world and, and creating jobs and investment around that. And, and that will just simply be the, the transition. Um, so from the, your question was about is it iron ore or is it copper, but actually what it is is, is advanced technology. And, and from a, an expensive advanced nation like Australia, what, where we can do things effectively is actually high value stuff, not digging stuff out of the ground. So the difference uh, in the changes in demand for uh, Australian fossil fuels as compared to uh, high tech, uh, low energy efficient uh, alternative energy things is one, the demand's going to go down, the other's demand's going to go up. Yep. It's an opportunity. Absolutely. And, and, and actually, I think from a communications perspective, I think sort of the, the people in the, the climate industry have failed on that communication side of things. So we can say all the bad things, we can say all the risks, um, but if you actually communicate with about opportunity um, and sort of the power of attraction, so you get people going, hang on, that's a great idea, we can, we can make money out of that by investing, or actually we can support that because it's good, we'll create jobs, then actually it changes that whole conversation. And, and having success there then breeds support and we'll, you know, we'll have the shock jocks you know, shouting for, uh, for, for clean tech and for, you know, <laughs> for, for carbon tax, or maybe I'm getting a bit far ahead. As was made by a former <laughs> prime minister when you have a choice between Alan Jones and the CSIRO, who are you going to believe? Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry, Martin. But just one point on that. I mean, we talk about a communication problem. This is not a communication problem in most countries. In Australia, we're having a debate about whether or not to retain a carbon price at all. In other countries, the debate is about how far do we go. 
And so you will have seen, um, we, might, we might have seen in the paper yesterday that Margaret Thatcher's ex, one of her ex-ministers, was very critical of the Abbott government. Now, Margaret Thatcher was the one who shut down the coal mines, talked a lot about climate change and the need for action. That's a conserv very conservative politician moving a long time ago in a particular direction because of something that made, made sense. So it isn't necessarily a, a, a conservative, non-conservative political issue. And in Australia, we are very much in a bubble perhaps a little bit with, with part of Canada, or at least at the federal level, not at the state level. But in most countries around the world, the argument is how far do we go, not do we move. Giles? Point two on, you were asking about the fuels specifically. Um, there was an interesting analysis came out from Alliance Bernstein, which is a very conservative US investment bank, and it was talking about the prospect of energy price deflation. And it noted that um, uh, solar is now cheaper than um, oil fired generation in the Middle East. They use that. It's cheaper than diesel generation in many places in Asia and Africa. Um, it's cheaper than imported gas in um, China and other places in Southeast Asia. Um, and by 2020, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, it'll be cheaper than new build coal in India and China. So that's a major game changer. And the point that um, Alliance Bernstein was making was that with this new paradigm, this new sort of technology cost profile, that's going to interest investors because the implication is that even with 1% or 2% of the market, that has an impact on price and the outlook for price. So you see all these investors who've been investing previously on a particular cost curve going up, depleted resources, you know, higher prices, and now seeing that that's actually the opposite. And so they, if they even get a whiff of energy price deflation, they will start moving capital and moving capital very quickly. And moving capital does two things. It raises the cost of the old te incumbent technology very quickly when the scarcity of capital, and it decreases the cost of new technology. Can I just say that that suggests that investors are more sophisticated and more savvy uh, on, around these issues than your average Australian or certainly Australian media. And I would put for, yeah, we would definitely hope so. But I, I'd put forward the example that's doing the rounds at the moment, that the, the reason why uh, the, imp uh, the increase in electrical energy in Australia has, been, has gone up so much over the, the last few years has, because, has been because of the renewable energy target, when an analysis actually shows that it's 79% of the increase is due to the old poles and wires gold plating the network. So there's something lost in translation there. Is yeah. that not true? The, the, oh, the, the word's not absolutely. getting out? Yeah, no, I'm actually shocked by the mainstream media and the willingness of it to accept this um, lock, stock and barrel from the politicians who are doing it for well and political and ideological reasons and not calling them out on it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite shocked. You know, what we're seeing at the moment is a bit of a revolution in technology. And we saw it 10 years ago with the IT revolution. We saw the media embrace that and wrote about that. And they were fascinated by it. And they really embraced it. And they challenged it, but they wrote about it. They, and they were informed. This particular um, transition has just been written about so appallingly. There's just complete lack of information and just on ideology. And of course, as you say, the increase in electricity costs is really all about the networks. Um, and, um, and I could probably go on about what's going to happen there. But yeah, I mean, it's, um, that has not been related to the people. So people in the general population still have got this idea that um, renewables are demonised. Even though they've got a soft spot for them, they still think it's more expensive than it really is. So okay. I just want to throw to a scenario. So the New South Wales government is holding a seminar in a couple of weeks from the five key players who print solar panels off a printer. Right? Just print them off your computer. So if you move forward, so five years, ten years, we've got batteries where you can basically put, you can print solar panels off on your computer, stick them on your roof. I'm sure it's not really that simple, but, but, but we, are, we are sort of, this is what we're, we're moving towards. You have a battery where you store it all the time. You don't need the grid. So again, you know, to move from the Kodak to the, to, to the digital, investors don't wait. I mean, you know, and that old saying, we move from the Stone Age to the Steel Age, not because we ran out of stone. So the reality is, is that in, investors are there to make money. They don't care about politics. But what they do care about is certainty. And where you have markets that are ultimately dependent on regulation, then it be, it, investors you know, are very cautious and wary. So when we have a lot of policy debate about changing carbon pricing, rent pricing, it's very hard to make a long-term investment if your investment relies on that at a cost. But on solar, the rate we're moving, that'll all be academic. It'll just be a choice between old technology and new technology. Uh, moving on to the idea of overseas investment and how that's going to be changed with uh, climate change and the effects of climate change being rolled out. Um, you did make the point, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm calling you out here, but 
Earlier, you suggested that Abbott Point, the reason why Deutsche Bank pulled out was because of uh, the climate change question of investing in coal. Whereas, in fact, the reason why they pulled out of uh, backing Abbott Point was that there wasn't the security in the environmental impact statement process that, that, that therefore uh, undermined their confidence in investing in there. So, yep. you know... Although, have I got that story wrong? No, I think so. I think there are all these all these stories. The dynamics are are more difficult in the sense that they were lobbied very hard on this is a coal facility causes problems to the climate, and, and therefore you know you, you need to change. Others lobbied on the fact that the environmental assessment wasn't correct, etc. But most of the campaigners were saying, and even the, the the campaigners from Queensland who were saying you can't have this happen because it will destroy the roof and it will destroy. Queensland tourism. There are many different drivers for that. What what these companies ultimately make, you know, put, put the statement on is what is probably the most easy easiest to to, to present. And it, you know, and it is true that the environmental impact statement didn't take into account alternatives. And that is a very and that's that was the whole debate at the World Heritage Commission. Um, but ultimately, we are seeing investors sign up to principles on responsible investing, not wanting to be subject to stranded assets. On, you know, for example, the, the investor group on climate change, Australian super funds who are very concerned with climate issues, they are starting to take into account these issues. And CalPERS, for example, in the US, has been very vocal about expectations that the companies in which it's invest will take action on climate. So we're just seeing this sort of increasing um, growth in, in sort of commitments by investors to be very careful how they invest. I mean, the Norway, Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is a classic example where they've said, we're not going to invest in fossil fuels anymore, and we're going to withdraw from fossil fuel investments. That's that's a significant. Um, that's I think I think that's one percent of global investment in fossil fuels. So it's a very significant shift. Ironically, that money comes from fossil fuels in the first place. But I was about to say, oh, the irony. But but the, but the reality is, it's even more de demonstrative of change. It's mm -hmm. the fact that it, even if it comes from fossil fuels, there is a, a definitive desire to change. Uh, which actually brings us neatly to the concept of stranded assets. Uh, John, as I understand it, we should be viewing coal companies as having 80% of their assets stranded because they'll never be allowed to dig them up. Is that a, a, a reasonable shorthand case study of what a stranded asset is all about? Um, to some extent, it's not that they won't be allowed to be dig it up, it's just that the market won't be there potentially. So, you know, it's just that the market's going to change and the price will change and the, the good assets will still be dug up and, and sold for a good, for a, a reasonable price and the more expensive assets will become too expensive. Have you tried to tell Clive Palmer that 80% of his wealth is now <laughs> never going to be realised? Well, luckily he's a great supporter of, uh, of the climate these days, so that's, <laughs> uh, that's, that's excellent. The, just, just back on the, the investment side of things, there's um, a project we're involved with um, with a, a global group called the Global Clean Tech Cluster Association. Have, we've um, basically signed up an agreement with the P80 pension funds, so the largest 80 pension funds, to find projects for them to invest in. So they, they only invest in chunks of 500 million or more, um, and usually projects are somewhat less than that, particularly when you're, you're doing sort of you know, little projects around town. So they've got this cluster of 50, 50 clusters around the world, um, all starting to bundle up things like LED streetlights into bundles that are investable by, by the Norwegian Sovereign Fund and, and others, and, and actually then enable a whole raft of money to come into, into the sector. Um, a bit like Giles was saying, sort of once it starts flowing, um, you know, it, it will continue to flow. And, and, and your question about are investors sophisticated, um, uh, some of them are very sophisticated and, and a lot of them are like sheep. So once the big ones and the clever ones start going and going, hang on, that's old, that's, we're not going to make so much money there, we'll start moving there, then everyone's going to start following very, very quickly. But, but just on that point, I mean, about the stranded asset points, I think this is quite important. So when we talk about coal, you can't grip all coal. I mean, there's different types of coal and there will always be a market for coal, for coal in the foreseeable future. Um, the issue is that if a country decides that it's going to put a cap on its emissions and it can't go beyond a certain limit, and if the world decides that, then we have far more fossil fuels in the ground. And if we burn them all, we'll go over that, that, that limit, you know, multiple, multiple times. That's the theory of stranded assets. So purely saying we've decided as a community to cap our emissions so we can't keep burning those emissions. And it's, it's no different from saying 
we as a community decided it was no longer acceptable for factories to put mercury into, in, into our waterways. So we therefore capped how much... There's still mercury around, but people have got to find alternative ways to destroy it. So it, it, it's exactly the same principle. We're saying there's got to be a limit on how much you can cap. So then the question becomes, well, where in the economy do we stop those emissions? And is it in the fossil fuel sector? Is it in the, the, the airline industry? That's very difficult. Is it in the agricultural sector? And that's where different economies will make those decisions internally as to the best way to do it. But I think the important thing is that, um, you know, this stranded asset concept is really a numbers game. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. And, and the solution will be different in different yeah. countries as well. And, and if we find some miraculous solution overnight where we can suck all the carbon out of the atmosphere, well, then arguably you can burn all the fossil fuels you like. Don't suggest that, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Giles, uh, another of the uh, consequences for Australian businesses of international policy outlined in this report is the emergence in other uh, countries of disruptive technologies. What, what do we mean by disruptive technologies? And if they're happening in other countries, why should we worry? Well, I guess solar is the classic disrupt disruptive technology. Um, and that's just, it's going to change the way um, um, business is done. Um, a lot of what we have in, in Australia, um, you know, the big business the big business investment decisions have been about the Galilee Basin and Abbott Point and just this assumption that we can continue exporting coal um, forever and ever and that demand will stay there. And that, it gets back to the stranded asset thing. And quite clearly, that's not going to be the case. And the problem with Abbott Point is that um, it's not like a coal mine which you can open up and maybe dig, dig furiously for four or five years, still make some money and then close it and walk away. Abbott Point and other bits of infrastructure have a life of 15, 20 years. And those are the decisions that these banks are taking into account because oh, we might not see risk in the first three or five years, but we sure as hell see risk for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so, um, yeah, we're going to see a lot of disruptive technologies. And if we simply... Um, have what our current government is is telling us that it's business as usual. You know we're a low energy, we can, we're energy rich. We can export all of this stuff. Um, we can just ignore clean clean tech, um, and it's um, the the future looks like the past. Then you just deal yourself completely out of the world economy, um, global economy, and you're really causing a lot of problems for for the domestic business and export business and, and, and what have you. Yeah. And I think another important point there is. If you're an investor, you are fairly sophisticated. So would, do you believe a statement that says by our Prime Minister where he says, you know, in the past no other country is doing anything or we have some of our business leaders on Q&A so, um, saying that other countries aren't moving? So do we believe that and base an investment decision on that? Or do you base an investment decision on, on, on the fact that California has an emissions trading scheme, China has an emissions trading scheme, and those multinationals are regulated under those schemes. So what do you want to believe? I mean, if you're an investor, you follow the law. You don't follow what our politicians say. And so I, I find it quite extraordinary that people are so... The people who are, who are agreeing with what the politicians say are the ones who basically don't have a vested interest. But the investors know very well where, where their assets are being affected around the world, and they're looking very closely at that. It came as uh, something as a shock to me when I found out recently that not only has Sweden got a carbon tax, but they've had one for 20 years. So, uh, you know, once again, the uh, Scandinavians thinking well ahead of the curve. Uh, let's move on to another aspect of the report, which is managing domestic risk. Uh, and something that, uh, coming from a science background, that really appeals to me about this report is it doesn't so much deal with the science as this is the end point. We will have X degrees of warming. It will have X, Y, and Z effects. It deals with the science as it should be de dealt with, and that is the trends are, and this is the direction they're going in. And therefore, the economic and business trends will need to follow them. And one of those trends is the number of catastrophic, catastrophic weather events associated with climate change. Who would like to talk to what's actually been observed and how business can react to that, uh, the increase in uh, uh, catastrophic weather events? Um, <laughs> uh, 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 
I'll, I'll start with um, the second bit of the answer, then, and okay. then Martin can, can do the first bit We'll of the work answer. our way backwards. And, exactly. That's fine. So, um, based on what Martin's about to say, um, what's, uh, the, <laughs> the, um, from a, from taking it from a, to a more local level, um, so that there are, you know, there's, there's global, large global events that are causing huge, huge impacts, and, and the uh, reparation costs are a lot more than it would have been if you'd actually done some sort of um, uh, defence costs ahead of time, and, and that's, that's a, sort of the, the, the decisions that are going to have to be made within public spending. Um, but taking it to more local levels, so the, the, the South Australia Climate Change Vision, that there's a document that our, our council uh, published a few months ago, um, is building on, there's a whole lot of uh, vulnerability assessments being done at a regional level across South Australia. That then gives you the framework to start understanding what the risks are under various scenarios. So if sea level rise is this, or, the, or we have more hot days like that, then the impacts are going to be like that. So, so you actually start having this framework and, and structure that you can then build upon the pathways. Well, if, if we end up heading going this way, we will need to start doing that. You know, we are going to have more problems with the health industry, or we are, are going to have more problems with, um, with transport. Uh, and you start building that across all of your government frameworks, then then it enables you to sort of have this this pathway to 2050 or, or wherever it is um, that builds in the, the various scenarios of science that are, that are there, including the catastrophic events. And the first part of the answer is this. <laughs> <laughs> so I forgot the question. What, 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 <laughs> what has been happening with yeah. respect to catastrophic uh, weather events? Well, I mean, so I think, you know, we, we, there's often a political debate here, so whether or not a catastrophic event is caused by climate or not. Uh, I think the, the starting point is that the climate is changing. Events are becoming more frequent, and the volatility as well. Uh, some are becoming more frequent, some are less frequent, but the volatility is in the system. And often the environments are being created for these disasters to occur. So when we have longer, hotter summers, drier seasons, that's more conducive for bushfires. So um, at a domestic level, there is a lot going on. And it's when you read the material from the CSIRO, you read the material from people like the Climate Institute, uh, people from the Climate Council, it's fairly clear what is happening. I think we need to come to terms with the fact that there are parts of Australia that are no longer suitable for agricultural investment because the weather patterns are shifting. They don't get the rainfall. There are, there are areas that were previously good for vineyards that are now moving into agriculture. Agricultural areas are going back to forestry. And these patterns are shifting, and um, you know we need to sort of, sort of, I guess, be aware of that and and plan for it. And again, um, while while the drivers for an investor is very different to the drivers for, for a politician. So a politician goes, for example, I remember um, probably speaking at a school here, but I had a we had a climate change council meeting with the then New South Wales Minister for Climate, who was um, Frank Sartor. And he just made the point that, you know, the challenge politicians face is they're often it's the here and now. So you go up to Byron Bay, houses are falling into the sea. The person expects the government will write them a cheque and pay them out. Whereas an investor says, well, I'm looking at investing here. And, and a good example is probably, I think, um, one of the old uh, Run the River Hydros in Victoria. I think it was Pack Hyde, um, it could be Pac one of the hydro companies. Um, when you, the predictions were the rainfall in the area where these hydro facilities were, the rain was not going to the rainfall pattern was going to decrease over the next ten years, and the CSIRO, CSIRO science was there, and it was proved to be correct, and they didn't have rain, and they did not generate electricity. So investors are probably more savvy at looking at these sort of issues now, I think, and working out you know what will be a risk and what won't. Uh, an example that's given in the report is of the town of Roma. Uh, in 2005, they had the opportunity to spend $20 million building a flood levy bank around the town. They decided not to, because $20 million bucks sounded like a lot of money. Since then, uh, more than $100 million has been paid out in insurance claims since 2008 for Roma uh, because of flooding events. And the repair bill over is over $500 million, uh, by, uh, and that's being incurred by both the private and the public sector. Giles, we really need to start thinking ahead and ahead of the three-year political term? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not too sure how we're going to have that happen in the current political environment. Um, we're seeing, you know, at the moment we're responding to three-word slogans 
and doing little, little else apart from that. So, absolutely right. And, and this, is, this is extending um, through insurance assessment on, on climate risk. It's actually ensuring, um, extending through, in Asia there's a lot of work being done on what's sort of called natural capital, which is about protecting mangroves and other valued resources, because the value of those intact far outweighs the short-term value that you might extract from exporting them by chopping them down and putting in a, a building or taking down the forest. And there's much more recognition. The problem is there is to actually how to overcome the politics of that because politi politicians are often about development and therefore they've got, to, you've got to pull stuff down and build new stuff. Um, so to get that into the thinking of, um, of political decisions and investment, I, th I think the investment community is right for it, but to get that into political uh, debate takes a while, but I think it's seeping through. I think it's seeping through, and I think, I think the, the, sort of the global international debate over the next two years, particularly with the UN um, summit and the, um, the agreement in Paris, which I have no doubt I think will be successful, will yeah, obviously have some doubt, but I'm quite confident. Uh, and I think that's gonna change the rhetoric, not just of you know, your carbon policies and your immediate climate policies, but the whole way these, these things are addressed um, politically. Yeah, I think, uh, I think our political rhetoric is now out of date with where the world is. And if any of you haven't seen it, Giles put a piece together recently on the, uh, on the British-China announcement on climate change cooperation. And I urge you to go, over, go back and have a look at what he wrote. But that, uh, that statement between China and, and the UK is basically a, a, a bilateral trade investment agreement around developing technologies around climate, about moving towards much more aggressive targets and ensuring they get an outcome in Paris. I mean, it is a remarkable read. I and mean, when you've got, you know, America mirroring a very similar agreement with China, it, it just demonstrates to you, you know, we're in a very different place now and our domestic political rhetoric is far removed from what's going on out, out, else, out, out, out there in the world. And, sure. and on, I mean, China, China has the advantage of not having three year elections, and that, which is incredibly useful for this sort of longer, longer Maybe term. Maybe we should be moving to that. Well, I, I've suggested it a couple of times, but I'm told, <laughs> told not to suggest it again. Um, but it, I mean, it's been fascinating. I, I do a lot of work up there as well, and it's kind of it's fascinating watching what's driving the activity there, and not, not just on, on climate, but just you know that all of the you know clean technologies and all the environmental technologies. There's it's mainly about you know the people are getting richer and they're demanding a, a better quality of life um, and living with pollution is not acceptable. The Beijing cough um, is wonderful in that not only the poor people have the Beijing cough but actually the leaders and the rich people have the Beijing cough and the, the political drive to find the best environmental technologies around the world and then grab them, take them, uh, sort out our own problems and then produce them as an economic development initiative is, you know, is, is huge. And, and it, Again, to me, it comes back to the, the power of attraction in that there's, a, there's, a, there's upsides there. You know, you've got to argue the upsides. So where, where the political debate here will change is where they see more upside than, than downside. So what, what are the upsides to this? Why, why can I sell this and look good um, rather than sell it and say the prices are going to go up? I'm going to sell it and say we're going to increase our jobs. You know, so, so that's when, when the, the political dis debate will change in Australia. Just to continue from your point, uh, Giles, about three-word slogans. The problem with three-word slogans is, of course, it's also a three-word slogan. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have an opportunity for questions from the floor. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We will get a camera and a microphone to you. But our first question actually comes from out there in the ether uh, via tweet, Twitter. We've had Katrina Skellen ask, in a carbon-constrained environment, how do we fundamentally shift our traditional manufacturing sectors to a new way? Anybody? Okay, um, I'll take, uh, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm doing a lot of talking, so, <laughs> but, um, so I think, so, so there are a couple of comments. First of all, our manufacturing sector is changing anyway. I mean, it cannot compete globally, and the government has made a decision it's not going to underpin some of those sectors that it doesn't see as, as worth all like the car industry. So it, that, that's the first thing. Secondly, if you impose a carbon cost across the economy, then manufacturing itself will become more efficient. Um, and it will find ways to change. And I'll, I'll just give you one example of that. Um, I, I chair an organisation called Low Carbon Australia, which was set up by the federal government under the, the Rudd government, which was $100 million to give loans to people in the building and manufacturing sector to reduce their emissions. For the first year and a half, we had to convince people why it was good to do energy efficient projects and to borrow money against your own balance sheet to do that. 
and there was a lot of you know, reluctance to do that. But, but basically, eventually, we found that people started to, would come on board. Now, the moment one person in an industry got on board, everybody followed. And I want to give a, a simple example. There's a, there's a manufacturing or meat processing company in Queensland called JBS. Um, JBS, and again, I noticed they were in the paper today in the Fin Review talking about the carbon price, but they had said, the CEO of that company said, the carbon price is terrible for us, we'll lose a lot of money, we'll probably go out of business, it's very difficult. Um, go, he then, and the company then, took a loan from Low Carbon Australia. They made their business very energy efficient. They, the, the, the savings in the electricity bill were significant, and as a result of that, they were able to, they, they paid, you know, that loan was recovered, you know, we recovered fairly quickly. Um, but two interesting things came about out of that. The CEO was then in the local paper after this had happened, saying that um, that basically they were wrong and that this, in fact, was a, was a very good thing and it had driven them to change. But the second really interesting thing that happened was that about seven other abattoirs, as soon as they saw the press release about this, were into low carbon asking for money. So a lot of investment is about, and change, and driving change is about people are very fearful of that change and not sure if it's going to work. And it is a big investment for someone to turn that around. But if any of you saw, um, saw Four Corners this week, there are a lot of people who talked about putting in solar and investing in energy efficiency and the significant paybacks they got. So I think a lot of it is to do with education and saying these are good things that can happen, but once they happen and investors are comfortable, things will move fairly quickly. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to move it along because we do have a question from the floor and we're running out of time. Uh, we have a camera. Excellent. Your question, please, sir. Uh, it's Craig Wilkins from the Conservation Council of South Australia. Um, last night we had the very great pleasure of hosting Charles uh, to basically talk about South Australia's incredibly exciting renewable energy story. And it's a story which um, we... Th we feel is not actually known very well within our state and we should actually be shouting it from the rooftops. Um, so my question is to the panel is, is um, what is South Australia's story about renewable energy um, and um, where do we need to go in terms of being, um, you know, in terms of investing in people and systems and policies to make sure we stay ahead of the curve? Okay, let's start with Giles there. What, what, what is the situation in South Australia? Why should we be proud? You should be proud because um, with the completion of the Snowtown 2 wind farm, um, the p penetration of renewable energy in the state is 40%, roughly, which is by far the biggest in mainland Australia. It's only beaten by Tasmania because of its historic hydro, and that's pretty exciting. What's even more interesting is that because about 32% of it, 33% of it, or one third of dem demand is made up of wind energy, um, there's also a lot of rooftop solar, the highest penetration in Australia and possibly the world. And together, they make the highest penetration of what's called variable renewables, 40%, uh, um, probably in the world, once again. And it hasn't brought the economy to a halt. I think Electronet said in their submission to the REP review that it has, hadn't actually incurred any extra cost and there was room for more. And it's brought down emissions and it's brought down the wholesale price of electricity and made a couple of coal generators and oil generators very, very grumpy about reduced earnings. Um, but what it does show is that there's enormous potential to move far forward and far quicker than anyone ever thought. And if you just, one of the points I made last night was that um, if you look at the Australian energy market operator and their forecasts for South Australia, they're saying that within 10 years, the impact of energy efficiency measures, what Martin was talking about within manufacturing and also home efficiency with good appliances, and the combination with rooftop PV would actually bring down consumption from the grid by... Um, 25, 20 to 25% um, within 10 years. And then if we keep the renewable energy target and South Australia gets its share of the new build, then you're practically at 70 or 80% or 85% renewable energy already. So, you know, if you wanted to get to 100% just for the sake of having a number and, and, and reaching a thing, you know, it's, a, it's actually not that far away. And it may not be that far away in Australia um, across the country because if you accept what Andrew Blakers from ANU said, um, even if you just let all the current fossil fuel generators retire gracefully at their appointed age and replace them with renewables, um, then by 2035 you've got 100% renewable energy. Now, it probably won't happen like that, yeah. but that's to show that we don't necessarily... If we're going to build a new plant, we now know that the cheapest new plant will be renewables. We now know that um, because of rooftop solar and the cost benefit that that affords households and businesses at, at a distributed level, and we now know from the CSIRO that one half of all um, gen um, demand will come from on-site generation and storage 
um, within 20 years, that's just a complete change. It actually shows that this, this is actually going to happen really quickly this. and it's going to be quite dramatic. Yeah. It, I, I, and, I, and it gives an advantage back to the South Australian businesses who are buying that electricity because they've actually got now got a longer, longer path of understanding where their electricity prices are going to be and it's not open to LNG pricing in China. It's actually, you know, it's built capacity. I, I, I'd love this discussion to go on all afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, but I've got a hard deadline. I've got to be out of here in three minutes to be on national radio. So... Just quickly, in summary, I'd like each of you to tell me who you would most like to see get a copy of this report and what they ought to do with it. So, <laughs> Martin, put you on the spot. I'm not sure I'm allowed to answer that question of what I really think. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I mean, uh, I, what I would genuinely would like to see is, is our politicians you know, be open to some sort of rational scientific debate and actually be open to listen to what our scientists have to say and recognise that the world has moved on. And I think, you know, all of those who oppose these issues really do need to have an, more of an open mind. And the great irony is South Australia is an example of a perfect free market working where we have solar coming in and displacing older technologies. So if you want to talk about free market economics, this is what it's all about. John. Um, certainly, uh, certainly, the politicians. It's, it's not just the scientists. They need to listen to the to the investors and, and you know the rational arguments in there about this is about opportunity and and about Australia not missing its Kodak moment. You know, sort of the, the world is changing really, really fast, and we have an opportunity to either participate in that or import stuff, and all the good people will go and live somewhere else. And and that's 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 the choices that we have over the next ten years, five years less. Um, so, you know, understanding what the opportunities are in the economics of climate change is, is incredibly important. And Giles, who are you going to send it to? I'm going to send it to the advisors of um, key politicians. I was going to write a story a while ago saying the five most ignorant people I've met. And um, they would be the um, advisors to some of the politicians. Um, it's quite incredible and I think they need to, to read this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I commend the report to you and could you please give a big round of applause for our three fabulous speakers this afternoon.